Hello. Today we're going to talk about uh, managing recreation facilities. This lecture is heavily based on uh, Mall and colleagues' textbook, Rec Recreation Facility Management, uh, the second chapter. Whether you're supervising staff or operating a facility, maintaining equipment, or running a softball tournament, you are applying recreation facility management practices in one way or another. All leisure service organizations use some form of recreation facility management. And I've myself been surprised uh, how much um, facility management I've done in, in my career. Um, you know, I probably started being a camp counselor, doing uh, some small repairs, you know, um, to cabins and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I guess uh, maintenance or cleaning and that sort of thing of the camp. I was also a synchronized swimming coach, as I've probably mentioned before, and our club decided to build its own pool. Um, I ended up then doing, uh, like, the, we didn't really have, um, we had the president and, like, the board members for the club. It was a not-for-profit. And then there was, like, the head coach and then a few other, like, uh, you know, next level coaches. I was one of those. And then a few kind of, you know, um, part time coaches more. And anyway, we had to do cleaning, um, testing all the chlorine, the sound equipment, the change rooms, etc. And even in my job uh, in human kinetics and recreation, I've been surprised how much I've done in terms of facilities. For example, helping to figure out renovations for the building, or it's also just about, you know, helping to keep an eye on things, reporting when things uh, aren't going well or there's a leak. Um, and also being involved with the play program, having to, you know, help a lot with the, all of that equipment and inventory. So regardless of what the core product is, meaning like, if you're delivering your a special event, you're a spectator facility, your aquatics, you know, whatever it is that the experience or services, that core product, um, that space where that happens is a facility. The facility is essential then to the quality of the leisure experience. The ability of a recreation professional to oversee the facility can have a significant impact on the success of product delivery. But um, we know, though, that we haven't really focused on facilities management a lot in um, recreation degrees. I probably mentioned at the beginning of this term, we used to have one course specifically on facilities management. We took it out. Um, later on, we have gotten feedback that, especially in Newfoundland, a lot of professionals do do facility management. We found out that 80% of them did. And this is especially if you are in a not-for-profit, uh, a rural organization, or just a small organization, you know, like informal. For example, my synchronized swimming, it was just got started, you know, uh, it didn't have like a, um, a full structure. So it was a lot of kind of volunteer hours. So the importance of managing recreation facilities is really often um, underappreciated. And especially when you really think about how it affects the you know, delivery and experience. So facilities can make or break the experience. You know, um, I mentioned, you know, there's, uh, I'm a swimmer myself, um, you know, I've been in many hotels or gone to visit, it, I've, I've never seen it so much in, um, like, recreation centers, but, you know, even, like, Wedgwood Park can be awful uh, before I've been there, maybe it's not now, um, and you see hair and disgusting stuff in the pool. You know, I have driven much farther just to be able to go to a nice clean pool. And, you know, like, if you come in and the washrooms are dirty, um, I have here a picture of a planter wart, and that's because um, because of gross pools I spent uh, as a coach. Um, the, the pool that we had, it was constantly, I constantly was having warts on my feet. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about for four years, uh, and it was just awful. 
had to get, you know, the nitro done every week and stuff. Um, anyway, it affects like the staff and employees uh, and and obviously uh, can be a bad experience. And even though, for example, in our pool, it looked clean, it, it looked clean, but obviously it wasn't proper or we wouldn't have been getting um, warts all the time. And by the way, I wanted to find a picture here of um, an unclean change room. And I advise you never, ever, ever Google dirty pool change room. I was shocked. Um, facilities, you know, it also affects like the playground experience. Um, and this is, of course, what's always in the news. Think of uh, facilities, uh, playground equipment being involved in injuries. Um, and now, in my opinion, a lot of this is uh, we've taken, we've sucked the fun and risk out of playgrounds. And there's a lot of research showing that playgrounds aren't very effective the way we've designed them because they're too safe. However, if you have poor equipment um, or anything that's not safe, um, you know, that, uh, you know, besides, you know, do this at your own risk sort of stuff, um, then that can really uh, affect experiences and community. Of course, there can be injuries from broken or poorly maintained equipment and structures. Um, you know, I uh, myself have, you know, um, gotten <laughs> plastic uh, cuts and stuff from slides. Uh, even the new um, park, at the Rotary Park, the, it's beautiful facility there, but um, my son went down it and I don't know, there was just sharpening something sharp in the tube slide. Uh, and he, you know, he got a great big cut on his leg and was bleeding. Um, obviously, there have been so many injuries with certain types of equipment that they've banned them. For example, when I was a kid, I had grand fun on, I think they called the merry Um And obviously, you can see here, like, for example, fields, tennis courts, and that sort of thing. These things don't just look poor, but they... Um, also can cause injuries like uh, if you're running around on the field or court and there's all these like divots and rough spots it's really easy to trip and broken and poorly maintained equipment can also reduce the quality of the experience um, I'm sure some of us have been to places that look like this where you know you go to use for example the exercise equipment and it is you know half of it is broken or is dirty um, you know uh, there's many parks and you know, especially community parks where you see uh, things like you know this uh, the soccer, net where everything it's broken and same with the basketball court um and you know there's also some issues with those things staying nice but uh you know it also gives the impression or change rooms being out of order um you know i've i've been to facilities where <laughs> like uh you realize like they're never fixing that washroom because it had it's gone on for like two months uh, and same with here, I, I was trying to find kind of a picture of a rundown facility, but, um, you know, this uh, it um, is like the recreation center. Uh, obviously, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't seem inviting um, to go to this place, you know, to go and have leisure. So that's about quality. So a facility by definition, is the environment where leisure activities occur. There's a range and variety of facilities. This can be like natural or human made. So these are, um, you know, naturally occurring resources or so, uh, resources, yeah, like parks or, you know, lakes, or it could be human made structures like museums, health clubs. They can be indoor or outdoor or even a combination. Um, they can be simpler, complex, like a simple, like, let's say, a small little community garden or versus a hundred acre park. And also, depending on the organization you're working for, it can be public or private. You know, if you're, um, it could be if it's a, for example, a golf course, uh, that might be a private um, golf club. 
whereas public uh, would be for uh, anyone in, living in the community. And these things can have different, you know, if it's public or private, has often different views on expectations of the facility, but also uh, is a, it also implies some things for more risk management. So recreation facilities exist in two broad categories of structures. One category is the natural environment, um, where very little, if anything, has been constructed by people. You know, obviously it might have, uh, you know, washrooms or, you know, food facilities or that sort of thing. And the other category is recreation facilities uh, that are all human made. So the natural environment, as I've mentioned, this can be anything that includes, you know, trees, water, uh, the mountains, lakes, caves, uh, anything that's more maintained in its original and natural state. But it could also be, I mean, we might not think this, but it can also be like the slope, like ski slopes. You might have a facility there, um, you know, a, um, a downhill ski facility um, is got both kind of natural and human-made structures. The ski slope is, is not often, you know, it's usually natural, but then there's other obviously human-made structures. And obviously parks and forested areas are the main, you know, natural environments. And this could be a very small place, like a tiny corner downtown um, that's like a little garden area, or it could be a little park, or, you know, it could be a very up to a large natural, um, or, you know, national park. Natural environments often have a management component, um, that regulates the use of that area. You know, um, for example, that, you know, uh, Pippi Park, for example, has, um, is an area, Pippi, um, that has to be maintained. It has both natural and human-made structures, but its mandate on that land is that it is it's regulated. It has to be provide. It can only be for recreation or educational purposes. But those um, similar to like Pippi Park, it could have these auxiliary services. So things like related to facility um, users, such as you know boat, canoe, kayak, and ski rentals. I'm thinking of. Um, you know, Pippi, uh, the image there is the uh, ski and snowshoe rental at Pippi Park. And you can see you might have a concession stand, for example, at Bannerman Park, to, you know, to get your uh, um, hot dog or your, um, well, I, what I would get there is my elephant ear, if I was there. Um, and these types of facilities can be managed by local I should put, pardon me, for state, uh, provincial or federal agencies, or it could be a private entity that's um, for use by the general public. Human-made structures or facilities, um, they're a designated area that facilitates a process, an operation, or a course of activities, and it's conceived, planned, and built by people to deliver a specific recreation product. These can be indoors or outdoors. And sorry, I've kind of repeated myself there. Design, uh, you know, obviously this is usually like, it's going to be like a sports field. So it's for field-based uh, recreation or it's aquatics facility um, or it's, you know, trails and hiking. They're all for kind of providing a specific product or service. An outdoor human-made facility can range from local peg playgrounds or tennis courts, or it could be like a large water park or sports stadium. An indoor uh, human-made structure can also be observed in many forms, like bowling alleys and fitness centers, or indoor arenas and major resorts. And some structures may consist of both indoor and outdoor facilities, such as like swimming pools, um, and, you know, and that could be indoor, outdoor, and having concession buildings, locker room, etc. So facilities vary, as you can see. It's very difficult to, um, you know, 
managing a facility is really going to depend on how complex and how it varies by these different things. You know, for example, um, if you are working for the city of St. John's, you're probably not going to be doing as much facility management because they have facility management people. But if you're the director of McMoran Community Center, where you're over a not-for-profit, small staff, um, you know, board of directors, you're going to be having to engage more in facility management. So facilities vary by extensiveness, uniqueness, and complexity. So it varies, um, the extensiveness often varies, um, you know, by the unique nature of what it is. It might be uh, recreation facilities serve a multitude of purposes and they are going to vary in size, volume, and also square footage. And obviously as the size of the, you know, square footage of the facility or acreage, whatever it is, grows as the number of um, users, like the capacity of it uh, increases, it's going to be more complex. So, you know, um, obviously, for example, being like being manager of the facilities manager, they're probably called uh, vice president of facilities or something at like Disney World in Florida is going to be very different than, you know, managing um, being the director of the Boys and Girls Club in St. John's. So the extensiveness or even like the number of products or services provided at a facility, it really indicates the complexity of the recreation facility management. And a facility management, you can see in this diagram from the textbook, um, it really, you might be, there's a lot of different types of things that you might be having to look at. So like risk management, maintenance, etc. So you can see here, um, uh, uh, in the first box on the bottom, we have foundations of recreation facility management. So someone who's a facility manager has to understand, obviously, facility management. They're managing these facilities, and they have to learn the basics of that. They might also have to design and develop recreation facilities. So assessment, planning, looking at blueprints, finding funding, helping with the construction. You might have... Um, be responsible for the resources for the facility, like the equipment, the finances related to the facility management, as well as employees who are specifically under uh, facilities management uh, uh, mandate. You might also have to focus on the utilization of the facility. You're probably going to be helping with circulation, safety, security, about scheduling, for example, you know, the facility manager is the one to say, hey, no, uh, that room can only have 30 people in it for fire regulations. So we can you can't have 40 people um, in that in that room for that program. And obviously maintenance, uh, emergency response, especially like um, it could be to do with health and safety, but also like, you know, flooding and that kind of thing. And they also might be responsible for all the auxiliary services, playgrounds, all aquatic. Um, there could, you know, concessions, if there's anything like that, uh, changing facilities, et cetera. So it can really vary um, with what is needed. Facilities vary by their uniqueness. So each uh, recreation facility uh, is unique as a result of, you know, that specific design and the product that's being delivered. It also is going to be unique based on the administrative style, the management philosophy, staff composition, and the leadership. For example, you know, you, you can take the exact same blueprints, the exact same design of a facility. Let, uh, let's just pretend I'm the, um, the Aqua Arena, okay? We could build the same building, the Aqua Arena, in a different city, like let's say Corner Brook. And they're going to be different. They have the same square footage. They have the same size, et cetera. But they're going to be unique because of who's managing it, the um, clientele and the community that it's serving, and, you know, who's working there. 
So the functions of the facility manager remain the same, but it there's uniqueness uh, and diversity, obviously, from facility to facility. So each recreation facility is, re uh, is uh, unique because um, of administrative style, management philosophy, staff composition, and leadership qualities. And I would also add type of product that you're, um, you know, how many different programs and services you're offering. Facilities also vary in complexity. Um, facilities and equipment have really evolved into a science. It's often a science of human behavior, um, of structural and mechanical technology, making the daily duties of recreation facility managers more complex than ever. Now, this is obviously, again, not necessarily the case at, um, let's say, a community center. But if you're working for a large facility um, in, you know, in St. John's or another major city um, or outside of Newfoundland, this may be, you know, a part of the tasks. So, you know, we have now um, uh, things are a lot more digitized. And so uh, even like uh, ventilation systems, um, you know, how things are managed, it's all a lot very much computerized and, you know, these sort of complex systems approaches. So complexity is really referring then to advancement in technology equipment and these mechanical systems. So these advan advancements then have led to you know, we have enhanced comfort and efficiency for everyone, um, include like employees and users, and this could also be the environment, but it creates a more complicated work environment for management. And I mean, I would say a good analogy is think of cars, you know, um, when I started driving, um, it was fancy to have um, <laughs> your uh, windows be automatic instead of like the crank system like um you know that was just starting um and you know think and now i you know it's amazing the computerized of our how computerized our cars um for example my parents wanted to uh give me one of their uh, used cars but uh, it's just so fancy and computerized that you know just to change something, it's costing you like a thousand dollars because they have to take all the stuff out and it involves computer technology. Um, so sometimes um, it's not worth it. Well, I said no thank you to the car, actually. Um, and so obviously, um, just like that, like with facilities, it, it depends on how your role is obviously uh, going to differentiate depending on how fancy the facility is. Now, none of you are going to be in an environment where you're really in charge of this massive facility management system, but you should understand the rule because you might be working very closely with facility managers, especially if you're in an administrative position. So recently, the role of facilities in the operation of organization has taken on new meaning. Today, the emphasis is on utilizing a facility to its capacity while maximizing revenue and minimizing expenses. And uh, I shouldn't say when we're saying uh, utilize, that doesn't necessarily mean number of people, although it is in a way. But, you know, it's often like the better facility is utilized, the more it is perceived as beneficial to the mission of the organization. Um, for example, um, you know, if you're, um, let, there might be like, for example, different communities who are wanting um, a new community center. Perhaps it's very old. Well, if the community or the director, whoever, cannot prove that they are effectively utilizing that to the best of their ability, that facility, if it's not, if it's underutilized, then the, like trying to get a new facility will never happen.
So why is there this emphasis on utilization or, you know, maximum potential? It's obviously um, a demand for functional space. And that includes kind of like interesting designs nowadays, advanced technology, legal code interpretation, cost savings, protection against liability, and interest in sustainability. So I'm going to speak about each one of these in turn. So sustainability. Um, it refers to operating a facility while minimizing its long-term impact on the environment. Um, we also often heard that, you know, being green is another term referring to the ways that a facility can be more efficient and lessen its negative influence on the environment. And, you know, recreation facilities are being designed and operated using technological advancements in materials and efficiency systems that minimize their effect on the environment. So, um, for example, we're now seeing things like green roofs. We're seeing um, on the bottom right there, that is a ice arena that has uh, solar panels in order to, you know, help control costs. Uh, you know, as we have climate change, we know that uh, arenas, specifically ice arenas, like one of the, hockey is... Um, one of the reasons why hockey is becoming so expensive is the arena cost is so expensive um, in order to maintain uh, because it's not it's just not cold enough um, outside in a lot of places and they're just very expensive. Uh, so we have to look at these. I mean, even on um, in the provincial government, in Ontario, uh, you know, a few years ago, they had a big push about even people, you know, uh, it was about getting ready for the increase in um, electricity costs in the province. But you may recall there was all, always commercials, even on YouTube, about changing your facility to LED lights. And they, and they had that. And, um, you know, it, changed, it, uh, did, it does uh, save a lot of money. But we have to think also even in terms of, like, the products we use. Uh, and also, in my opinion... Um, especially, I would say people nowadays, people are looking for sustainable options. I mean, um, this might be to the extreme, you guys, but, you know, like when I, I'm not much of a hockey person, but in part it's because of my environmental ethics. And so, you know, I'm not quite there yet with my kids, but, you know, I... I'm not really a fan of them playing hockey because of that. Now, I would feel very differently, though, if... I was taking them to a facility that, um, you know, was sustainable. And I'd pay more money, too, for that, to be honest. So we also want functional space now. Um, Underutilized space in a facility is not only inefficient, it also has negative um, fiscal repercussions. Today, recreation professionals have to place more importance on analyzing and assigning space to maximize its use. And this can be even, you know, like putting little, uh, for example, I notice this all the time now, um, in newer facilities, they always have in all the little odd nooks and crannies, they'll have sit sitting areas or, um, you know, quiet areas and that sort of thing. Few facilities can afford to have space that is not being used or is creating expenses without producing revenue. And that's how facilities actually think of, like, facilities actually look like that. Like, what is the whole cost of operating this facility? And you can break it down by space in terms of how much revenue it is making uh, in compared to its operating cost. So in an effort to maximize resources, recreation professionals, you know, have to analyze the product and seek to make all facility areas as functional, you know, a functional part of the production process. And of course, there's advanced technology now. Um, there's automated, highly automated systems now um, that are integrated with human capacities. And I think we're going to see this as more and more, especially, you know, um, with the COVID pandemic, we're going to see more and more of technology. So this is um, like computer-oriented 
uh, oriented efficiency systems. So that's like, um, you know, your HVAC system and so ventilation and heat and all of that is very, you know, very automatic. And you might not think this is, you know, big <laughs> discoveries, but for example, like even um, thermostats that um, go up and down, automatic thermostats, you know, that's a fairly new invention. It happened since I've been a kid anyway. Um, and so, and now they're, you can be very complicated, you know, especially in some major facilities. And obviously the, those systems are very important, uh, especially they're going to be important with reducing germs and, you know, with, uh, the COVID and, um, also they're going to be more complicated and things like, you know, those systems are more important, for example, in aquatics facilities, um, you know, look at. Paul Reynolds building, one of the reasons they um, were getting rust and that sort of thing was because the ventilation system wasn't good enough uh, for uh, an, a place that was so was wet all the time. So recreation professionals faced cha uh, changing technology um, and there's a lot of things they have to look at, especially with equipment and that, you know, even think of, you know, sports equipment chain has technology uh, a lot with it nowadays, or, you know, even, um, you know, I even think of like uh, teaching equipment, you know, we've gone from, um, you know, acetate to <laughs> um, finally we had, you know, PowerPoint and, you know, now we're, um, doing everything online. And so even in my job, there's been like the advance in technology has been extreme. The textbook just talks about code interpretation. I want to emphasize inclusion here, um, but because inclusion, equal opportunity and a safe and healthy environment to users and employees is obviously important. You have to look at the provincial and federal um, written codes that protect the welfare of all users and employees. And it's important that you read these, uh, even if you're not the facility manager. You have to interpret and apply these regulations and it requires uh, attention to protect the recreation agency and its users. And if you're not familiar with these codes, um, then it's negligence. And it could, uh, it's, you know, can have serious consequences. Uh, lawsuits, formal reprimands, termination of employees, etc. Um, you know, let's say you have a special event and you didn't follow fire code regulations for that. You can't claim, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know of the regulations. <laughs> That's It's called negligence. I love uh, cost savings. I'm not so sure that cost savings is like a new trend, but anyway, that's how the textbook talks about it. But obviously... What a trend is, though, is that facilities need to be more financially accountable for their operations. And you can see that. For example, look at um, the convention center, my, like Mile One Stadium. Lots of goings on in the news for years and years and years about uh, the finances of that facility, you know, who's responsible, etc. Financial efficiency can result in lost income, decreased profit, uh, profits, and negative perceptions of an agency. And this is especially true. It can look, you know, really bad, obviously, for public um, and not for profit. If, um, you know, nothing worse uh, than, you know, raising, fundraising to get a new building and then not be uh, managing it properly. So financial managers nowadays have to, they really have to look at all these different things. They're not just running the facility, they have to financially manage it. So they need to look at utilities um, and, you know, maintenance costs, labor, and just, you know, general facility financing. And finally, uh, liability is also a big thing, and recreational professionals have to take every precaution to protect users, um, you know, from of their product. And this is but the facility, the equipment, or the experience. 
So you need risk management strategies uh, and provide, you know, facilities and equipment that are free of mental and physical dangers. And I want to emphasize the mental. It used to, there used to be much more just an emphasis on physical dangers, but nowadays we have to consider, you know, mental and emotional dangers as well. So when we look at the influences on financial managers, it comes down to three areas. The responsibilities of recreation facility managers are influenced, <coughs> pardon me, both positively and negatively by the function of the facility, the employees, and the users. And these then all play an important role in your product or service delivery. So I'm going to go through the positive and negative influences of these three factors on recreation management, facility management. So facility uh, functionality. Um, positive influences, well, the existence of a, of a facility really has no significance until the product production and del delivery occur, meaning that like a facility just on its own is nothing. The people have to come in there. There has to be the program or the event or the service in order for that facility to then have a purpose. And of course, each facility can be like retrofitted for different purposes. But once this management system is functioning, you know, then the facility has their you know, reason to exist. A recreation facility and its equipment then have to be functional and coordinated with the production process, and that will help then for good uh, product delivery. But negative influences of facility functionality is that um, a recreation facility is only as good as it's designed to, to function. I mean, look at our phys ed building. We've, uh, you have, it's changed a lot in the 14 years I've worked for uh, HKR, and it changed a lot even before that. You know, it's an old building. We're limited in what we are able to do due to the limitations, you know, of the building. Um, or, for example, um, you know, uh, we at one point we did have a uh, like we, uh, for example, we don't have a uh, elevator properly to go to the different areas on the second floor. We've looked into that, and because we're embarrassed that we uh, teach disability studies, but we, you know, not very accessible building. But for example, I, I believe it would. I think it was going to cost um, eighty thousand dollars to put in the uh, a new um, elevator, or even more than that. Anyway, and it just um, for how old the building is, it doesn't really make that much sense. So it's limited. Also, a poorly designed facility can hinder the ability to do a specific, to produce a product or service or fulfill the expectations of employees and users. For example, you know, if you've got a rundown facility, there's only so much you can do to make it look like you're, uh, let's say you're a, pub, um, a private company, to make it look like you have a fancy uh, product or service, you know, um, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna pay the same or have the same expectation for for what price should I should be paying if I'm entering a building, for example, a yoga studio that's all run down on the outside. Um, could be the exact same yoga program, but if it's in a newer facility, you're going to be able to uh, charge more. Other. Um, Obviously, the facility, too, can be the most annoying part um, for employees and um, uh, users as well. Like, I'm sure you've all experienced this, doors being locked when they should have been opened, or the other way around. We're always having that in our building. Um, not having proper signs to direct users. For example, we finally have that. Um, I used to get quite upset. You know, we'd always have, um, <laughs> we used to always have um, the public coming into our offices in the phys ed building, trying to get to like the works and asking us, um, you know, and not that you don't want to be helpful to someone, but you know, 
um, it's a bit annoying to be interrupted when, you know, obviously that's not our job. So, you know, then we talk to them and we have, you know, had better signage put in. Or snow on the sidewalks. Uh, dirty or unclean, as I you must Google, um, or mouth, um, you know, broken restroom facilities, um, security systems, you know, safety things like extinguishers, uh, any you know, just unclean spaces or run down spaces. The employees can have positive and negative influence on facility management too. Obviously, positive. Well, they're a key component to the goal, um, the mandate, and that, which is obviously um, what the users are coming to the facility for. Generally, you're gonna have employees that are trained to be competent, they're certified, you know, professionally developed, et cetera. They're gonna, I'm sure most of the time we have, you have awesome employees. And often um, really good employees are not reactive they're proactive they anticipate problems and they can avoid them and often then might see issues in the facility before they become problems but in some um, influences unfortunately employees can have a negative influence on the facility um, employees not showing up for work displaying inappropriate attitudes or behaviors to other employees or to users performing their job poorly um, all this can have an unsatisfactory experience on everyone involved, employee, you know, uh, employees and participants. And, uh, you know, sometimes the, um, like one employee can have a major impact on participants and therefore their return. For example, the most important staff person in your facility is the greeter or, you know, the person behind the reception desk. Um, you know, there's, uh, I'm sure, I don't know. I have personally, like for stores and that sort of thing, getting my hair cut and that, you know, uh, I don't often go back to a place if I, I didn't have a nice chit chat with the receptionist. So, you know, these things are important and it could influence whether, you know, whether you're retaining customers. And obviously the participants, the users can impact. So um, this is obviously can have positive influence because success depends on you bringing, you know, meeting the needs of the participants, having them enjoy purchase and get a beneficial outcome. Your, the whole point is to um, meet users' expectations and hopefully have them come back. You know, whether you're for profit or non profit. And um, obviously, the, um, you know, users can, you know, participants can make your facility awesome and um, help others want to come too, like just having um, nice people in your groups and that sort of thing. But users can negatively influence a facility. Obviously, there can be um, serious disruption or negative behavior, rude behavior. Um, let's say discrimination, uh, there could be violence or violating rules, smoking in other areas, not uh, using appropriate language, physical altercations, vandalizing, damaging equipment. You know, there's always going to be people that do these things. Uh, I, I, in my, you know, I guess it depends on your facility, but um, obviously how many people do that kind of depends on the community, the type of facility you have, and more specific, like the culture that's been created in that facility. And obviously users can also have, you know, diff difficult employees can also, or uh, participants can also be difficult for employees to have to handle. So, the uh, basic responsibilities of recreation facility management then are all, I guess, the, the following. You need to ensure quality delivery. Uh, facility managers have to make sure that the facility is being operated efficiently. And that um, isn't just about the building, but like how the people interact with the building. It's about being flexible and being cost efficient and making a lot of it has to do with 
uh, effective human resources and relations. And obviously, as we've seen um, from you know the Paul Reynolds Community Center, uh, there can be a uh, a lot of issues with um, how facilities, you know, are built, constructed, it can become extremely political. And um, to be honest, like, especially in St. John's, like, or in Newfoundland, I mean, like, I, I think uh, it'd be very difficult to meet everyone's needs, and make everyone happy when you're building a facility. But um, we have seen ways of maybe it not being done well. So organizations with the responsibility for um, large, like large populations, like military, community, colleges, universities, correctional, schools, hotels, stadiums, recreation centers, hospitals, all of these are places where someone could go and get a job if they were a facility manager. There are different types, obviously, um, you know, for example, um, my past student, uh, Jennifer Janes, she is the facility manager at the Paradise Recreation Facility. She doesn't have any formal like facility management experience, but she gained it, you know, through her different jobs going up. Um, and, you know, she's not necessarily totally responsible for everything to do with like the structures of the facility. She has other experts there. But um, as I said, there's, you know, the, what is more likely is that the smaller, for you guys, the smaller the organization you're in, the more you're going to have some of these, um, and on, in your job responsibilities, or you're just going to end up having to do them. Um, and it's just important that you, um, you know, you might need to seek, sometimes you might have to seek some certification or other training. So there's tons of different um, facilities management uh, certificates and courses. These are generally um, at the uh, college level, like a diploma. And like, um, for example, uh, you wouldn't need this for may maybe being the manager, but for example, someone working at a facility who's in charge of the uh, ventilation system would have like their you know HVAC uh, certification and that sort of thing. Um, there's also the associations. For example, um, we have, you know, there's tons of different ones, but for example, in um, Atlantic Canada, there's the Atlantic Recreation and Facilities Conference and Trade Show. And uh, that's a place where, so Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, and New Brunswick all come um, for a you know, a conference for a recreation conference, but then there's also a trade show associated with it where there's everyone who uh, does equipment and different systems and they're all there uh, to talk to. And there's also even magazines, for example, there's the Canadian Facility Management and Design um, magazine or you know journal i found uh and there's even associations a lot at the local level for example i found um in toronto there is the hotel engineering and facility managers association so it's just anyone dealing with that is operating a facility in the toronto area so hopefully you learned a little bit um about managing recreation facilities Although many of most of you will, you know, this will never be your primary job. It's important that you understand these roles in order to work with facility managers. You also, uh, I hope what you mostly got from this lecture is that it's very important to understand that the facility is integral to the quality of the experience and it should never be disregarded and uh, facilities management shouldn't be taken lightly and in my opinion facility managers are very important and should be sitting at the table for all management decisions.